Well, good morning all. This morning we are in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Um, I don't always give a, a title to the talks, but I have this morning. And it's titled Barriers to the Gospel. Barriers to the Gospel. I wonder if you ever thought about a concern for holiness, somebody's concern for their holiness as being a barrier to the gospel. That sounds a wee bit strange, but it is possible and it's actually something we see in our passage today. A concern for somebody's holiness or group's holiness being a barrier to the gospel. I am hesitant to say that our passage this morning um, in some ways repeats last week's in fear that you just switch off. But um, if I'm honest, it does some ways. But before we maybe just drift off and say, well, I was here last week, I heard that last week. Um, let's just remind ourselves of a few basics. None less than the blessing that it is to have this book before us. Both in Acts and in the whole Bible. And what it is, that simple thing that we know, but maybe sometimes just need that we prompt. That God himself breathed it out. And if there's something, um, or on that basis, there's nothing in here by accident. And if there's something in here that's maybe in twice, God decided for it to be in twice. And I don't know, maybe it was just maybe me needed that encouragement this week that it was worthwhile to study it. But I also hope that as you listen, that you will be open and ready to be spoke to and challenged by what God has both said now, or both said back then, and is more than able to say this morning through it. But I do reassure you that the theme of chapter 10 is very different than chapter 11. And I also strongly believe that God wants to speak this morning, um, as he has been to me this week. But there is a benefit going over similar ground. Robert last week has dealt with some of the detail, which will help us get quicker to some of the lessons and applications. So to get us up to speed, whether you maybe weren't here last week or just by way of reminder, I'm going to quickly talk through what happened in chapter 10, and then we're going to read the first 18 verses of chapter 11. So in chapter 10, we had two main characters. We had Peter and we had Cornelius. Peter, we well know, know well from the Gospels and from Acts as well. Simon Peter, he was a disciple. He was quite passionate and outspoken at times. And most importantly for this context of passage, he was a Jew. Uh, he's currently in Joppa. He's staying with a man called Simon who was a tanner or who worked with animal skins. So that's our first one. Our second one, our main character is Cornelius. Cornelius, as Robert talked about last week, he was a Roman centurion, maybe looked after, say, 600 men, socially quite prominent, quite wealthy, but most importantly, he was a Gentile. And he was described as a devout man, he feared God, he prayed continually to God, he gave alms to the poor. And these two main characters in chapter 10 had two visions. Cornelius had a vision where an angel came to him and told him to send men to Joppa, where Peter was, and to bring Peter. So it was Cornelius' vision, go get Peter, bring him back. Peter also had a vision, a wee bit more detail. He's seen a great sheet coming down, hung by the four corners, seen animals in it, and eventually, essentially God telling him to rise, Peter, kill and eat. And that was in relation to the food laws. And I also had the spirit tell him to go, the men are looking for you, and go with them. So that was the two visions. And on the back of that then, Peter meets these people that were sent to find him. They travel, they go to Caesarea together to meet Cornelius. And there's discussion, which I'll not go into now, but essentially Peter brings the gospel to Cornelius and all those gathered. And just a main point I'm going to bring out of that was that Peter said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. And that's a big thing for a Jew to say to a Gentile. And that's 
one of the main thrusts to keep our mind on, that the Jew, Peter, goes to this Gentile Cornelius and says, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, everyone. And then the climax of chapter 10 comes when the Holy Spirit falls on these Gentiles and Peter commands them to be baptized. So that's a quick run through the 48 verses of chapter 10. Now let's read the first 18 of chapter 11. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times and was all drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent from Caesarea, and the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house, and they told us how I had seen the angels and stand at his house and say, Send a job and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God give them the same gift as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. And so that's um, our passage today. And I started off by saying that in this passage, holiness was a barrier to the gospel. What did I mean by that? Well, the verses that we have just read, what happened? Peter was initially being criticized in Jerusalem by his fellow Jews for what he had done. And it was in the name of holiness, in the name of being set apart, in the name of being separate. For he had seen the gospel spread to the Gentiles. He had seen people indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He had seen people come to walk with God. But in the name of holiness, in the name of traditions, in the name of rules, he was criticized for that. If we take Peter and remove the vision, if we take Peter and remove the instruction that God gave him, by the Spirit, then he would not have entered the house of the uncircumcised. He would not have went in and ate with them. His views from the Old Testament laws told him that they were unclean. And if he wanted to maintain his holiness, he would not socially mix with them. Holiness would not allow him to bring the gospel into them homes. And us sitting here years later with our understanding of what was happening and what has happened since we very quick to jump on that, wouldn't we? How narrow-minded. How foolish. Yes, there were ways that the Jews had twisted a couple of laws that God had given and taken the intentions. Sometimes it was exaggerated that they would have been separated more than God had intended. But ultimately, God had given them these laws to start with. And that's where we need to spend a wee bit of time just to get a grasp on that. So we're going to spend a few minutes considering uh, what is the purpose of these laws? What are these laws? Specifically the food laws. Um, so first question, why did God give them? Why did God say there's certain foods that they cannot eat? Well, there's an argument for hygiene. But that doesn't really stand up because it's actually in Mark chapter 7 in the Gospels where Jesus declares them clean. And the whole food safety standards from Moses' time to Jesus' time wouldn't really have improved much. 
So that doesn't really hold fast. But if we go to that, if you flick to Mark chapter 7, um, and that's where Jesus cancels them, it'll give us a wee bit of an insight. So Gospel of Mark chapter 7 and verse 18. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile them, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, witness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slender, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. And so from Jesus' explanation here, I'm going to note two things. One thing is, what was God's focus? It was not about the physical food. His focus was on the moral uncleanness of it, making it very clear to differentiate between the food that went into our stomach and was expelled, and that doesn't defile us, but it's what is in our heart that defiles us, and, and making sure that them things are different as he explained that. And that leads on to the second thing I'm going to note, which was that the disciples misunderstood that. Because they had a misunderstanding that these things were linked, that they could eat something that was unclean and that would morally def defile them, that that would affect their heart. But Jesus shows, no, 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 it's not the physical food. And so the only th unclean thing about these foods was simply for a time God had designated them as unclean. He had defined them as unclean. And now, with no difference to the physical food, no difference to the chemicals, no difference, he defines them as clean. Which is why he was able to say in Acts 10, do not call anything pure that God has made clean. How has God made it clean? Because he's now calling it clean. The food is the same, is it not? Okay, so God's ban on the foods made them unclean. But why would he do that? Well, it was to teach a lesson. God was able to teach Israel a lesson about the ceremonial idea of clean and unclean. We know that Israel was separated out from the other nations to enjoy a special relationship with God and to carry a special role among the nations. I'm going to flick a wee bit. You can follow with me. If we go to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. What does God say? In verses 5 and 6, he says, You will be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Treasured possession... Kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So we do see that Israel is going to be a special relationship. And as part of that special relationship, they were commanded to keep themselves pure from the moral and spiritual uncleanness that polluted the Gentile nations. We'll go to Leviticus for two verses. Leviticus chapter 18, first of all. Um... And so they were called to be pure, and this is some of the laws that was given to them in relation to that. And Leviticus 18, verse 24 says, Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things. For by all these the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean. And the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants, left the land you vomit out when you make it unclean, as it has vomited out to the nation that was before you. And then two chapters later, Leviticus chapter 20, and verses 25. Again, the same idea. God says, you shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean and the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourself detestable by beast or by bird or for anything on which the ground crawls. For I have set you apart 
to hold on clean. You shall be a holy for me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I've separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. And so from them we see the background that in the Old Testament, God did call Israel to be separate. He did did give them laws about food and about special relationships and holiness. And when these were given to Israel, they had some mixed effects. They had positive effects. What was the positive? Well, it reminded them and reinforced to them that position, that they were a special people, a unique people, a holy nation. Every time that they maybe had an appetite for food, a hunger, and they went to eat something, what did they think? Well, they thought, is this clean? Is this unclean? And in that itself is a great lesson, a great thing to be taught, that every time we have an appetite for something, a hunger, not just physical food, every time we desire something, if I do this, if I eat this, if I go this place, if I say that, if I watch that, is that going to make me clean or unclean? How does that defile me? And that sort of idea of being intentional about what we are doing, what what we're not eating, but going places and listening to and watching, that they had that sort of built in as a law. But negatively, there was also effects of the laws. Immediately, the practical aspect was that they couldn't go and socially mix and eat and go into the houses of Gentiles and made that very difficult. And they had that constant reminder to avoid the spiritual and the moral uncleanness of the Gentiles. Now, maybe some of you are thinking it, but not all the Gentiles were as corrupt as each other or as defiled as each other. And by all means, there would have been Jews that would have been worse than the Gentiles. But Gooding um, illustrates this quite well. He describes it as a wall that was put around Israel. And he uses an illustration of a parent and a child to illustrate this wall. And he says this, Not all men are child molesters, but enough of them are to make it wise and sensible for parents not to allow their child to take sweets, money, car rides from any man they know. Not all of them are like that, but it makes it wise to say, don't take it from anyone you don't know. And a further point off that, maybe where a parent uh, tells their early teenage daughter, you know, you're not allowed to go to that part of the city, that sleazy part of the city, whatever it is. And it's not because their parents think that their daughter's essentially better than maybe the other girls that are there. But essentially, it's because they know she's no better. She has the same human nature that the rest of them have. And she too could become corrupt the way the others have. A good apple among bad does not improve the bad ones, it corrupts them. And so we have this idea of, well, I banned all the Gentiles because, well, that's a wise and sensible thing to do. And I've kept you separate because I know that you too could become corrupt. And so the use of these laws was to remind the people that they were separated to God and to protect them from the Gentile pollution as much as possible. And history shows that when they disregarded that wall, that they generally became just as corrupt as the other nations. And of course, there were limits and there were weaknesses to these laws. Israelites just took the pride of it, and they thought that they were generally better than the Gentiles, and they confused the ideas of moral holiness and ceremonial holiness. And this misunderstand and this twist led to the tension between the Jews and the Gentiles and hostility and the jealousy bred and the resentment bred. But why, we've spent them a few minutes on the law and the food laws, specifically the food laws, why? Well, that's to stop us just jumping in straight away um, and criticize Peter or, or what we've read in chapter 11, these fellow Jews as, you know, why did you think that? Why were you so narrow-minded? It's not like that at all. God had given them instruction. They were a special people. They were to stick by the food laws. But they were right at a time, but it was time to change. And this is core to this passage. They were right at a time, but it was time to change. What we see is God bringing through a change of attitude in an individual and in a group. That through this thing that had become a barrier to the gospel, 
They thought that they were protecting their own holiness. But now that was actually getting in the way of how God wanted to work. Chapter 10, what does he do? He deals with Peter. Peter starts off with saying, by no means, Lord. By no means am I doing this. And what has he done? He was brought through to the place where he was obedient. And what happens? He's seen them saved. He's seen the Holy Spirit fall on them and be saved and be baptized. And in chapter 11, he does the same with the group of the fellow Jews from a position of criticism and judgment to the place where moments later they are glorifying God for the very same action that they were criticizing moments ago. How was that done? How did that happen? We know ourselves that we don't just change. We are complex people of preference, of tradition, of experience, of sentiments, of emotion. And we need to acknowledge that. We need to put that out there and acknowledge that, that we are like that. The things that we hold on to, we don't just change. There's things in that we hold on to tight for different reasons. Well, Peter was praying, and that's a good place to start. He was in communion with God. And how did God change him? Stop being so blind, Peter. Go and witness to the Gentiles. No. God did not just come in and just rebuke him for being silly or not knowing what he wanted him to do. God understood the convictions that Peter had. God respected his loyalty of standing by them things. He didn't come to rebuke. He came with new instructions. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And as I said, what was Peter's initial response? No way. That's not how I've done that. I've never done that. But God was clear. God gave him a vision that he could see and a voice that he could hear. And God was patient. Three times over and over, rise, Peter, rise, Peter, rise, Peter. And he gave him a confirmation in that. They physically came and looked for him, and after he'd seen the vision, the people were actually there. And what more confirmation did he need than what he had just seen, that this wasn't, this wasn't his imagination. God was speaking to him. And in faith, Peter obeyed that. He went through with what God had just shown him, knowing rightly that it wouldn't be approved of. You picture yourself and Peter knowing rightly that this was not going to be viewed upon well. But in obedience, he went. And what happened? He saw the fruit. He saw souls won for Christ. He saw the Holy Spirit coming into people. And yet they criticized. But Peter walked them through. They, she told them, you know, well, this was happening. And I was praying and God came and this happened and this happened. And what was his argument to them? If God has done this, who am I to stand in his way? If God wants to do this, who are we to stand in his way? And if God is doing something or has done something or wants to do something different, who are we to stand in his way? What we see here is an individual and a group. They had a conviction, they had a belief, they had an attitude. And as we've seen, they could be from God. It could have been a pure belief, a pure conviction, a pure attitude at a time. Or it could have been twisted and it could have been something we have as a selfish motive that maybe was pure but we've, we've exaggerated or twisted it. But whether it was pure or impure, this was now getting in the way of the gospel going out about how God wanted to work in that time and in that place. And through them laying aside their maybe older convictions or whatever they had, people were saved. And through the group laying aside their criticism, God was glorified. And is this not what we want to see, that souls would be saved and that God would be glorified? That is what we see here. Is that not the, the message that it's, we're not saying that we change for the sake of change? We don't just go and do things because we want to change things. This is a message about being open, open before God, listening to God, that if he wants to do something the same way, we do it the same way. But if he wants to do something different, then who are we to stand in God's way of doing something different? And that's how God changed Peter. That's how God changed these fellow Jews that he had. 
that he came in and he showed them clearly they were open and he confirmed them, he was patient with them, he respected their views, but he brought them through and showed them this is the way that I now want to work. And he showed them the fruit of that in that obedience of faith. And as we close, we still have one more final piece of the puzzle. Why did he take the laws away? Why was it okay now to take that wall of protection down from around Israel? You know, them laws, what were they? Well, in many ways, they were a piece of text. Do this, don't do that. They give an instruction, but they were limited beyond that. They were described elsewhere like a schoolmaster. But it was time to take them away. Because there was something far better coming in their place. The person of the Holy Spirit. God himself coming down to dwell in them. Not only to give instruction. But to empower them in that instruction. That they could carry it out. Convicting them of what to do. Guiding them. Encouraging them. And changing them from the inside out. As we heard the defile of the heart. That he changes us from the inside out. And that's what really encouraged me when I started looking at this. That Peter, you know, you read that story and Peter got that vision so clear. He's seen it, he heard it, God spoke to him and, you know, it was just so obvious to him. But are we any different? The same spirit that gave Peter that is in each and every one of us in this room this morning. The same spirit lives in us. We as Christians have the Holy Spirit. So God wants to guide us. God wants to show us. We have that access. We have that communication with God if we would be willing to be open to what he wants to do. So what is God saying? And that's the, this is the challenge that I leave. What is God saying to us? As a church, collectively, rise Woodford What? What is the instruction? This is not a message that I bring because I have a gripe about something that needs to be changed. Far from it. This message actually changed quite a bit from what I intended to say. And that's why I feel so clear about it. My conviction of, of this message is that the step before that, not the step about what we're changing, but the step that we're willing to change, the step where we go to God this week and say, God, speak to us. Show us how you want something done. Show us because you live within us. We are not relying on a piece of black and white text, but we have a living God within us that day by day can speak to us and show us as clear as he showed Peter what he wants done. And that's a massive encouragement to say that we go out that with that inside us, and that's possible. And as for examples, I do want to be careful, but the one that I thought about and I will give is rally. Um, <laughs> I give it because it's... I give it because it, it means a lot to me. Um, I, I'm going to speak of rally. Uh, I don't just speak of rally for Woodford. I, I sit on rally council for Woodford. And so I speak on all rallies. Um, it's, str it's struggling. There's rallies this year that aren't happening because the numbers aren't there, the leaders aren't there. Um, and so as I've been thinking about that, not even before this talk, you know, I was thinking, God, why, you know, what do we need to do to reach the young people? And so my challenge as I thought of this was that we don't just copy and paste, that we don't just repeat for the sake of repeat. God has blessed Raleigh for 30-something years. He has saved people. But do we just start up this year the same as last year, the same as last year, the same as last year? No. He lives within us to show us what he wants to do. If he wants to do rally this way, he shows us. But if, he, if we need to do something different, we, we hear from him. If we need to reach people a different way, if we need to do it a different way, I don't know. I'm not being specific here. I'm just 
talking generally the time change and God at times has different seasons for things and different outreaches work at a different time and not just to hold on to or whether it's out of laziness or whether it's out of stubbornness that we do the same thing for no reason. I love Raleigh Aurora as well. And we have had to recently go through changes and I'll maybe in a couple of weeks give you more of an update on that but the numbers again aren't there and we have to go further and we have to go in different directions. And so I just give that example to maybe stir your minds. It goes beyond really and the meetings we have and the outreaches we have and just how we behave collectively as a church. We want to go into things knowing that that's how God wants us to do them. And we're able to be guided by God. We don't just sit here as blind people just doing things. God can speak to us. God can guide us about where and how and what if we listen to him. But again, I say we're not just changing for the sake of change. God will bless some things that we do and many things that we do and they don't need to change. That is not what this is about. It's about being open to know what would, should and shouldn't. I'm way over. <laughs> I'll just finish. The, that's the challenge for a group. But in as much as he changed the group of Jews, he changed the individual, didn't he? He changed Peter. And that's what I want you individually to go with this week. And I'm not going to give you his examples because the encouragement is that the Holy Spirit can tell you what your problem is, what he wants to tell you, what it is that you're holding on to. That you, the, the, the example from the passage was about a rule that um, affected a group of people. And whether it's a rule or a tradition or something that we hold on to from the past that we want to do things a certain way, or whether it's a group of people, whether it's a culture of people, whether it's a religion of people, whether it's a society of people, that we don't have the heart that we should have for, that we wouldn't go and sit in their homes and eat, that we wouldn't invite them to eat at our table. So whether it's that thing of barrier, whatever it is, and some sort of rule or some sort of group of people that we don't have the heart for, that we would go knowing that God can show us that. I'm not going to sit and point fingers. I know what God has challenged me about, and I pray that the, the, off the back of this that we go and we're open before God as individuals, knowing that he can show us. God, what way am I hindering the gospel? What way are my attitudes and my perspectives on things hindering the gospel going out in our mind right now? And that is a challenge. If we stick by them barriers, that's one sure way of making sure this number this morning is not going to grow. That's one sure way of making sure people are not going to be saved. If we just stick by what we, what we want to do and we're not open at all to what God wants to do. And so I just pray that we can go out this week holding on to that encouragement that we have the Holy Spirit in us. And we have the Holy Spirit and who are we to stand in his way if he wants to do something a certain way. May souls be saved and God be glorified through us individually and collectively. Let's pray. Father, we just are encouraged this morning that you live within us. Lord, that you are active and that you are able to speak to us, Lord. And Lord, my prayer, and I believe your desire this morning is open hearts. Open hearts to desire to see souls saved and your name glorified by us willing to set aside things. Lord, we don't desire change for the sake of change. But Lord, we desire your ways that you want to save people. Lord, help us to let go of things. Things that mean a lot to us. Things that have sentiment. Things that have tradition. Things that emotionally mean things to us. But Lord, the desire for the lost, the desire for people that are going to hell and need you in their life would be so much better than our stubbornness or laziness or whatever it is that could be a barrier to the gospel in our lives. Amen.